Well, I'm delighted to introduce you today, a, an old friend. We've worked together many times, uh, and yet our lives are as different as chalk from cheese. But uh, let's go over to the chalk because I love cheese. Ian, it's great to have you. <laughs> great to have you with us today. Uh, thanks for joining us. Now, the picture in the background, I think, reveals everything. You were an RAF pilot. Yeah, that's true. Yes, I flew for the RAF for 19 years. Uh, Hawk Hunters, Phantoms, as you see in the back, and Tornadoes. And um, were you ever involved in in um, in warfare? I wasn't directly uh, because I was a flying instructor during the Gulf War, so I was training crews to actually fly in the Gulf. Did that worry you that you might be training people to go to their death? Um, not really. Um, that was part of the you know the things that I signed up to, but also uh, sort of biblically, I've always held on to the, the centurion and. Uh, when he went to Centurion to ask for an answer in prayer, um, the Lord said to him, greater faith have I found in no man, but in this military man. So I've always taken heart from that, that the Lord didn't say become a pacifist immediately or do anything like that. So I believe that the role I played in self-defense, the nation training pilots to do that was, it was acceptable. Right. Okay. So clearly you're a man of faith, but you weren't always, we'll come back to that. Yes, Just a little yeah. bit more about your, um, the, the, the RAF because yeah, great to be in the RAF, but not many actually become pilots. How many people were supporting you when you were up there flying a plane? Oh, there must have been the uh, hundreds really, because you've got all the, uh, the ground crew, uh, the engineers, um, the operations team, the air traffic control, you know, there's, there's a whole lot because of the, the maintenance, the work, the background, the training, the instructors, the flight simulators, you know, there, there's a, there's a lot of people involved in flying a jet. And I think in, in the day I was flying, it used to cost about 10,000 pounds an hour to put one of those jets in the sky. Wow, amazing. Yeah. Now, we, as a little boy, Ian, did you always yeah. want to be a, a pilot? I did, in a way, because I'd had a difficulty in uh, at school, in education. I'd, I I was given some wrong information earlier at the 11 plus, and that sort of stumbled me. And I failed the 11 plus by being given the wrong information. Right. <laughs> and so, uh, I, as a young boy, I thought, living next to RF Bryce Norton, uh in oxfordshire and watching all the jets i thought i could prove myself that i was of some value if i trained to be a fighter pilot so i, I literally set my goal to do that and having seen those jets they inspired me with all the noise and the you know the, just uh, the aviation side of it was was amazing absolutely but it wasn't straightforward was it for you to become a pilot no it wasn't as i've said in the in the school <laughs> <laughs> the Royal Air Force needed, uh, you know, at least uh, five O levels, including maths and English. And maths and science, not a problem. English, massive problem. <laughs> and so I sat my English language GCSEs. It was not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven times. I would count that seven <laughs> times. <laughs> really? It was just devastating because every time you got a letter saying you failed, failed, failed. And <laughs> So I went on to do A-levels um, to actually continue to do a free access into the English language um, GCSE. So, uh, and finally got a pass in the last year of my A-levels and I actually left school at the age of 19. Oh, did you? Well done. Yes, Sarah. <laughs> well, why not? Enjoy. If they're the best days of your life, why not extend them? Yeah. <laughs> and so straight, straight into the RAF? No, challenging. I was turned down um, on three consecutive occasions. And uh, so that was a period of six years. Every two years I went to apply to Royal Air Force. I didn't feel good about myself in the sense I felt inferior to others. I was carrying emotional baggage and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and I always felt I'd always come at the bottom level and not at the top. And that was a great hindrance until God sorted it out for me later on in life. So for those six years, um, I was rejected on every count. And on the final count, um, I asked my own father if he ever thought I would become a fighter pilot. And, huh. and truthfully and honestly, which I accepted and I still accept, although he passed away many years ago, he said no. Mm, <laughs> and I just yeah. remember this like a, a, a concrete block of cement just landed in my stomach and it just stuck there. He told yeah. the truth. I accepted the truth. Mm. And so actually I turned my back on ever becoming a pilot at that time. And I went into some other jobs. 
amazing i i think this is a story of perseverance in, on many yes. levels uh, but eventually you 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 know you got into the raf yes yeah i had a miraculous um i was working with a company very briefly in a year into that i had a just had a letter come from the royal air force saying they would accept me for officer and pilot training huh. i never i never applied nothing it just arrived <laughs> and not being a christian then i didn't know that god you know loved me and had plans for my life and everything but um when i look back i see god's hand on my now, you say you went to christian did were you a church going person or, or not no, not at all i used to, we used to go to my twin sister and i used to go to sunday school up to the age of 11 or 12 and then we just gradually drifted away really mm. and uh, apart from maybe the very odd carol service or something like that we were not at all um yeah going to church or being involved in anything christian so how long after entering the raf and did you become a pilot well uh, to become uh, operational from st from start to finish a i failed my officer training first time so i had to go around <laughs> that again as well. You're so amazing. life was punishing yeah just keep going when they said do you want to do it again i keep putting my hand up yeah i'll keep doing it <laughs> Um, but uh, it it takes just around, it took me about four years to be fully operational to keep my wings because that means that you have to be six months on the squadron operational and become operational on a, an operational squadron uh, and that means you can keep your wings. So until then, you, you, there's no guarantee you can keep your eye of wings. So that is the moment you become officially uh, an RF pilot for the rest of your life, so to speak. And so you remember, it took you me a while. Your, do you remember your first flight? I do, yes. It, and the core sign, Alpha 4-3 with Martin Ashton, my instructor. Oh, really? And I always remember it. And we, we went down this runway in a jet. There was no propellers around on the front, obviously being a jet engine. And we just zoomed along and we climbed up above cloud. And, and I was I was amazed. Well, how does he know where he is now? <laughs> <laughs> and when we broke cloud to come in on an approach from a radar to land, you know, I just think, wow, this is incredible. Can I really cope with it? Because uh, I wasn't feeling that strong again emotionally to do with it but it was a very very exciting sortie now um ian it's while you were in the raf that you became a christian so how did that happen well it, it's an incredible story i probably don't have time to go into all of it because uh, because of my failures they said that ian you'll never be a fighter pilot you'll need to go on to transport aircraft uh, because you cannot assimilate all the information, so you need a captain, a navigator, an engineer to look after you. <clears throat> I accepted that, and I went to a base in, in Cambridge. And once and for all, for 50 years, the Ministry of Defence said, we do not need transport pilots, we need fighter pilots. Really? And yeah. so 12 of us were sent back to RAF Leeming in North Yorkshire to, to for extra tuition. Uh, to train as fighter pilots. During that time, uh, I telephoned the nurses home on my friend's uh, request. Uh, he, he said, ask ask those two nurses, Liz and, and Annette, if they want to come out with us to a nightclub. So so I telephoned and I said to, to Liz, would you like to come out with me and uh, my friend? And she said, yes, I'll go with your friend. <laughs> <laughs> so that oh dear, one, this is a story of real rejection. <laughs> it is to totally and utterly gutted, devastated. <laughs> and yet on that night, uh, Liz came out with me. And mm. um, the first thing she began to tell me, and I was just completely mesmerized and just mine was all over the place. She said she'd had an experience of trust, giving her life to the Lord and having a relationship with God. And she said, are you a Christian? And I was only, I'm still sort of 24 or whatever. <laughs> I said, yes, I was, <laughs> I'm Church of England. I'm an RAF officer and I was born in Oxford. <laughs> it was a joke. I had no idea what a real Christian was. And so Liz introduced me to, yeah, invited me to church. I was a bit hesitant, but I really liked the one. Well, we fell in love. We've now been married 46 years, so that tells oh, you how long wow. we've been together. But it was through through Liz that she introduced me uh, to, at least to go and to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that could be my personal Lord and Savior. Um, you, you didn't feel that she was a little, I don't know, a religious oddball or anything? <laughs> well, I did. I, I did on that first one because I thought, I, I, I invited her out. We went out on the second date, but I decided I'd do anything but talk about politics and religion. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you, she is passionate about God 
and uh, and and I hold her in great esteem always for that and always holding to the Lord and uh, so through her and her gentle and loving persistence plus other Christians up in the Leeming Middlesbrough church um yeah that that was the time when they introduced me to the Lord now I didn't make a decision for the Lord at that stage because a couple of things out of the 12 pilots that were selected for fighter training um only nine of those were were failed actually and only three were successful two university graduates from the Royal Air Force College at Cranwell mm. and myself which was a miracle and so before I was due to go to RAF Anglesey for advanced flying training on a little faster supersonic jet called a Nat um I asked Liz if she would marry me and because I was in love with her and I knew she was in love with me and she said no <laughs> And the reason <laughs> she said no was because she wanted to have a Christian husband and somebody that had the same faith and the same mm -hmm. heart for Jesus mm -hmm. that she did. And I, I didn't. I knew I had it in my head, but it hadn't dropped those 18 inches into my heart. Mm -hmm. So I said, what should we do? And she said she would finish her nurse's training and I would go and continue my flying training and we'd see what God would do. So we parted company. There was no mobiles, no emails in those days, just snail mail. Uh, we never saw each other. And to be honest, um, having heard the gospel and the love of Jesus, when I got to this new base, the um, the flying training was more arduous. It was harder. I felt I'd come to the end of all the energy, determination, uh, every aspect that I'd, I'd got to keep me motivated and going. It, it, just, it was just crushing. And I knew that the Royal Air Force were about to chop me too. So at 10 o'clock one night on the 10th of November 1975, I went to my room in the officer's mess and I said, Lord Jesus, uh, I can't take this anymore. Would you come into my heart and make my life better? I give my life to you and I trust in you now and for always. And it was just quiet in the room. It was peaceful. There was no loud noises or flash of lightning or anything. And then I said, Lord Jesus, um, I really want to tell Liz that I've become a Christian. That I've given mm. my life to you. Mm. Would you put me in touch with Liz? And immediately, and I mean immediately, <laughs> there was a tannoy call in, in the officer's mess for flying officer Ferguson. And I went down and it was Liz on the phone at 10 o'clock. Wow, amazing. I, I'm going, God is in the room. He's heard my prayer. And uh, we actually, that weekend, we got together and uh, we got engaged and the rest, they say, is history. But mm. that was an incredible moment, an incredible day, an incredible night where mm. God heard the sinner's cry mm. to be saved. You saved the sinner. Um, had you understood the gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ had died paying for your sin, that he'd risen from the dead, that there needed to be repentance yeah. and faith? Yes, or... I knew. Yes, I had. I, I'd heard. Heard that. I attended a, a little brethren assembly in oh, right. Rookwood in Middlesbrough. They were very clear about the gospel and they had a gospel service sharing that good news about Jesus mm. had, had died for died for me, loved me unconditionally and uh, wanted a relationship with me. And uh, it was up to me to make that decision to mm. receive Jesus and his love and his forgiveness. Now, Ian, how, how was it to be a Christian in the officer's mess? <laughs> Well, it was tough to be a Christian uh, in in that kind of uh, male. Well, it's not not now. It's not male environment because I've actually trained myself for the first girl fighter pilots. But at the time, in that male environment, it was quite tough. And I remember on my first squadron, um, with the greatest respect, I was the only Christian that was regularly attending church and having that relationship with God. But um, despite that, I found there was a lot of respect from the pilots and the navigators that I worked with. The, the Phantom of the Army is a, is a two crew aircraft, a pilot and a navigator. And, and often when the squadron went out uh, for an evening together, they would give me all their wallets <laughs> and I would look after all the bills and I would make sure that they got back home, all the bills were paid and all their belongings were safely kept. Amazing. So that was quite something. And on one or another aspect, if I could just mention it, it, it again, um, I was operational and um, uh, a, a flight lieutenant um, 
Al Monroe. He used to play a banjo. We used to call him Banjo. Banjo did the, the roster for um, QRAI, Quick Alert, Quick Alert and Quick Reaction Alert and Intercept, which is a five minute readiness state in Germany from sleep to airborne to defend uh, on this side of what was then um, the Iron Curtain. Mm. And I knew that th 365 days of the year, uh, including Sundays, I would be required to be by that aircraft. And yet my heart's desire was to go to church on Sunday. Mm. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't want any special favours from the rest of the lads. Mm. Uh, and I told Liz about it. And she said, well, as she always does, let's pray about it. We prayed about it. On the Monday morning, I was walking into the squadron in Germany and Al Monroe was walking towards me, pointed at me, he said, Fergie, that's what we call me, Ferguson, Fergie, yeah. you should be at church on Sundays, so you'll do more Saturdays, but you won't do a Sunday. And for four yeah. years, I served on QRAI, and I never had to fly on a Sunday. Wonderful. What it's amazing story. what God does. Yeah. Yes. Now, I want to talk about what God did when you came to the Yorkshire Dales, yes. and um, about 10 miles north of where I live, Ian, is a village called <laughs> Buckden. And above yes. Buckden is what's called Buckden Pike. I know you've been there. Yes. Tell us the story. Once. <laughs> <laughs> Once indeed. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, the story was, um, we were tasked at this stage from the UK, from Coningsby, to fly four, four Phantom jets they're supersonic jets 26 tons 38 foot wingspan and uh we're air defenders so we do what the spitfire and the hurricane did during the second world war we just defend the airspace and so we practice intercepts so one aircraft will will come against another one and uh we'll either pretend to fire a rocket go around the back and do a stern attack so two on two so two of us were doing the same and going around and uh, as I was coming onto the second target, I was the fighter, the others were the targets. As I came around the back, I just had to close up. So I was about two miles away and I needed to get within a mile and a quarter to simulate firing a Sidewinder heat seeking missile. And as I closed up, I had the reheat in. So I've got 33,000 pounds of thrust coming out the back, going through 520, 540 knots, which was well in excess of 600 miles an hour and the nose of the jet just dipped and I hadn't put that command in and as a flying instructor there was warning flags straight away something's not quite right so I went to ease the control column back to raise the nose away from the ground because we were at 250 feet uh, which is the lowest level we're allowed to fly over the UK and I was at a maximum speed and as I pulled the nose back, the jet flicked into an 8G, what we call a tuck up. So my head weighed eight times heavier. My body was, <laughs> everything was eight. So my head just went slam forward and the control column was by my right ear and I'd only moved it an inch. So I thought I'll move it half an inch forward. So if the jet is pitching and porpoising, at least there, there is safety in height. But as I moved it half an inch forward, the jet went from a 40, 50 degree tuck up into a 35 pitch down. And the whole canopy was just filled with ground and rocks. There was there was no sky. It was a beautiful blue day. There was no oh, sky, man. no cut, nothing. And so I eased it back again. This is all happening in a matter of a, a second or two. Mm. It tucked up again and I thought, I'm out of here. So I ran the stick trimmers forward. And, uh, and still flying the jet with my left hand on the throttle quadrants, two Rolls-Royce Spey reheated engines at full power. I literally just went down for the handle. That handle is just behind me over my shoulder. And it takes 44 pounds of power, you know, pressure to pull it out the seat. But actually, I always say it came out so easily. <laughs> and uh, then the gun cartridge fire, that large brass cartridge behind me, that fires. So my seat starts coming up. Uh, and then 14 inches later, for, there's a steel cable that fires a rocket that explodes that rocket and fires me out from naught to uh, 60 miles an hour in 0.3 of a second on 3,000 pounds of thrust. Um, and I always say I did feel all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so you ejected. 
So I ejected, yes. I had to eject. There was no way about it. And, so and now, but you weren't the only person in the plane. No, I wasn't. No, I, I came out and um, the jet slipped under my feet and exploded into the area of Buckton Pike. So I'm sorry it was near your home, Roger. I know you've dropped all this litter. On, <laughs> it's all over the place. <laughs> and, so uh, the plane crashed in Buckton Pike. Yeah, uh, but, did, yeah. but who else was in the plane? Uh, Steve Williams, my navigator. So basically my life was spared by five seconds. But he, I did scream to him when I pulled the handle, something we, we were told not to do because this is an independent ejection and the last time uh, a pilot had called ejecting the navigator had gone first the pilot came second but as the navigator was coming out the the canopy of the pilot sadly hit the navigator so at low level we were told just go and the navigator will leave when he sees a flame and a pair of boots in front of his eyes <laughs> However, as a Christian, when I pulled the handle to maximum thing, I just screamed out, ejecting, and, uh, and then I was gone. So Steve came out two seconds after me. He went through the fireball. His parachute, and I've seen the, the photos, literally from a circle, it was burnt in half. Wow. Uh, his helmet was blown off his head. His boots were melted, and he went into the, the mountain and broke his ankles, his back, and had head injuries. Uh, and this is on a winter's day in the snow. So he was then threatened. But I didn't see him when I was on my chute uh, because from pulling the handle to being on a fully developed chute is 2.75 seconds. It's even less now in the modern seats. It's only 0.9 of a second. But even in 2.75 seconds of all those things I've described to you, I was on the chute and I looked around to see Steve, but I didn't see another chute in the sky. And I was only on my chute. Uh, first time I'd ever done a parachute jump in my life. Uh, I was I was only on the chute for 20 seconds before I hit the ground and uh, not being able to release the survival pack that we both carry from coming out of the ejection seat uh, that slammed into my right leg. So I'd broken my right arm coming out the cockpit and a double break in my right leg uh, hitting the ground. Uh, I'm going to ask more about this because of something very fascinating, but but yeah. um, just as a matter of interest, as a taxpayer, how much do these planes cost? Well, mine was really, really cheap, Roger. It's uh, it's only five thousand five million pounds. <laughs> five million pounds into yeah, today, the bike in the Yorkshire Dales. Typhoons right. are around twenty six million, and the F thirty five Lightning two is is well in excess of that. I don't know, maybe fifty and, million. Again, I'll come back to the story. But were you okay. severely reprimanded, or what? What? what how do the RAF react to this? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, well, first of all, they set up a, 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 an accident, you know, board of uh, inquiry. And uh, so I remember just being in hospital just a couple of days later and uh, one of the team coming uh, and having a look at me uh, and asking me what happened. <laughs> and then they try and piece things together. It was very hard because the wreckage, as you say, was, was destroyed into very tiny little pieces. And uh, when they did a simulation of it, they realized that it was um, a failure in the pitch control, uh, an explosion in the tail. And, and I'll just keep it as simple as that. But that's what so they... So you didn't have to pay half the cost of the plane? No, no, thankfully, I'm not paying it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to go back to the incident because, all right, so you've landed yeah. on the ground yes. and Steve, the navigator, also landed in snow. Yes. And something quite miraculous happened, didn't it? Yes, it did. There was a number of things that kept Steve alive. And he's quite happy for me to, to mention these things because uh, I said to him, can I tell this story? Because Steve doesn't remember anything at all about the ejection or, or anything afterwards because he was so badly injured. But um, what we were told by the rescuing team uh, for Steve was that they went across to him and he initially he survived and simply survived because they found him uh, in the first aid unconscious position so he could breathe and that's remarkable that he landed in in that capacity having broken his back and uh, so, so many injuries that mm. he was found in that position the other miraculous thing we sometimes hard to get a head around there, there was a pair of footprints <laughs> coming away from steve in the snow in the snow in the snow and nobody had been there they just went to him they saw that and they saw him and he was 
uh, in the first aid unconscious position. And that was the initial process that. that so there were no footprints in the snow. No, there were no footprints in the snow approaching him, but there were yeah, footprints they were just coming away, away from him. Absolutely. So what do you reckon that is? Well, I just think that's divine. <laughs> I've just been absolutely frank. I don't have yeah. any other, other answer to it except it was divine, and and somehow it just shows the power uh, of God's love and care. You know, to to save somebody uh, in dire s situations. So it's Pope just incredible. Away really. the Maybe an angel or something. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, I t yeah, and yeah, yeah. But that point was a matter. Yeah, that I would totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. Some miraculous being that has gone and just placed him in a situation where he could breathe and uh, there was a chance of him to live and ian did recover fully did he so he did, sorry yeah. uh, steve rather steve uh, yeah he, he yeah. did we had um we were told that um he would he would never fly again he would never walk again he, he would have mental injuries you know and all kinds of emotional stuff and uh, as as Liz and I and the church and the churches that we contact said, we were just going to pray for this this man. We're going to pray for Steve, mm. and we prayed him. The nurses prayed for him. The physios prayed for him. The do Christian doctors prayed for him, mm. and uh, literally his his toes moved. He stood up out of a frame and walked, and mm. he made progress. And we both went back to flying. Oh, now, the really? only caveat on that was he had one displaced vertebrae in his back, so he yeah. couldn't sit on a bang seat again. So he went on to multi engines at Waddington on the AWACS and uh, he, he, he continued a full career and, re and retired uh, just a few years ago. Amazing. Incredible. Amazing. He, he survived. Amazing story. Now, yeah. Ian, all these years, I want to just move on to more recent years, um, but all these years in the RAF, but I know there's a lovely story. I enjoy this. When your last day, was it, or your last flight, anyway, yeah. tell us yeah. what happened. Yeah, was, we want uh, to know where our taxpayer money is being spent. So tell us what happened. Oh, it was brilliant. Yes. Yeah, well, well, the boss said, yeah, you can take a, a tornado and, uh, you know, you can, you can fly it where you want and do what you want. I said, well, I'd like to fly right the way up to Scotland, up to Fort William. Uh, high level, 30 or thousand feet, and then we'll let down low level uh, from the northern side of uh, Loch Ness and come all the way down from Fort William through Loch Ness, down through the lakes, and uh, and then across country uh, towards the Humber Bridge, out over the North Sea, and then back into Coningsby and Lincolnshire. So this was a this was a joy ride. This, this is, is just, just a, the yeah. Of... This is just a jolly. <laughs> Go on, tell us more. <laughs> don't show this to the don't show this to the apples, but <laughs> it was just a good fun trip, you know, all the professional stuff, but just a good fun trip. So we did that. And uh, the day was beautiful, the weather was fantastic. And I thought, well, this is the, the dream trip that ends, you know, the ends of the flying career. 19 years of pure flying, no desk job, no other thing just squadron to squadron instructor to squadron to whatever uh and i enjoyed it all and so we let down and um we're flying over i think it was windermere and i could see a, a windsurfer ahead of me <laughs> <laughs> and we were at 250 feet and he was just plodding along and i thought well maybe he needs a little bit more wind in his sail so i just <laughs> plugged the reeds in <laughs> <laughs> over the top of his head he didn't know we were coming <laughs> so i still think he's in the south seas having a great journey <laughs> well if he's watching do write in and tell us who you are uh, it's yes, an amazing yeah. story great fun. Yes. now um ian big uh, fascinating job to be in the raf but in some ways an even more fascinating one in in blackburn in a doctor's surgery tell us about this yes yeah well uh, yeah i've been a, a church minister for, trained for the ministry became a church minister and so on and i had a calling to go and serve in a, a doctor's surgery and they are it, it is a christian uh, based surgery and so there are christian doctors nurses and teams but there was a while I was there as in an advisory capacity, um, I spoke to the senior uh, doctor, uh, Alistair Murdoch, and he suggested out of the box thinking that they really needed a kind of a chaplain to help bring healing, not just the medical tablets, pills and all the other things, but emotional, practical and all of that. And, mm. uh, and I just thought, yeah, God's God's hand is in this. 
Um, so we prayed about it. There's lots of divine steps, which are no, no way I could uh, mm. explain in such a short time here, which is right. So, but yeah, so I started and, um, I, patients could could book in with me they could book in through the doctor they could book in through reception i always gave every patient at least one hour to come and explain all the things that were, were troubling them had the issues they had it was random it some of it was really painful it, some of it was you know suicidal some of it was things that happened in the in the past present addictions um housing food poverty energy po it was just everything about life and uh, yet there was an opportunity to be able to what we'd say is to minister to speak to to help that person mm. and um and the only thing i requested uh, at the end of it was could i could i pray with you the individual patient do you mind if i pray with you just at the end of what i'm doing for you whether it's practical emotional putting you in touch with somebody getting you food food thing or whatever mm. energy electrical bills paid whatever we did all that heating boilers everything and uh, they would say yes 90 99 percent would say yes i was able mm -hmm. to pray with people and uh, and help people and support people in that way and um, actually through that many people were touched by god mm -hmm. in an incredible so way it was very wonderful. special Mm. And one wishes there were more doctor surgeries like that, and and yeah. th there wasn't any pressure at all because uh, you know this was a Christian thing. They absolutely, they, yeah, very relaxed, and uh, yeah, we just we really. Uh, if people, I mean, pressure on you to be uh, to oh. be less Christian, as it were. You, no, it, was you, it was just yeah we were just we we didn't take advantage of people because no. obviously with people being vulnerable you have to be really careful you're not sort yes. of forcing any for, kind of christian teaching or persuasion or whatever it's just very gentle so mm -hmm. and most of the folks came back some of them came almost every week for for a couple of years and uh, mm. just sorted out all their their life's issues even getting people pensions and form filling and mm. a lot of asylum work um you know with families furnishing houses it, it was literally just the, the biggest spectrum of anything um but uh, yeah i felt very privileged to be able to do that uh, you know in the strength of the lord really um Going back to what you said right at the beginning, Ian, you were yeah. talking about God having a plan and a purpose, etc. Um, you see, some people might say what happened in um, Buckton Pike uh, in that accident. Well, it was just coincidence that you survived. Just good luck. Mm. But you, I think, would feel no, it was more than that, wouldn't you? Yeah, yes, I would. I mean, every day I flew, um, I used to lay my hand on the jet and just pray that God would always bring us back not just myself but navigator and everything as well so i had great faith that uh, the lord uh, is is bigger and greater and stronger than often we can we we think and it says he we, he can do more than we can ever ask or imagine mm. and uh, so i believe god is totally interested in each of us uh, no one is special uh, you know we're all equal in god's eyes the same unconditional love that i received anyone can receive that's listening uh, to this tape in the future and have that wonderful relationship with Jesus. He's not forcing himself, it's open arms. I came to him in, a, in an area of need. I'm glad that I was in that place where I, I, I needed God actually. So I'm not worried that I couldn't cope. I just thank God he was there to, mm -hmm. to hold me. Like a parent picks up a child, so Heavenly Father just holds us and uh can can change our whole circumstances protect us provide for us and keep us safe so it wasn't just the ejection it was five engine failures a fire in the cockpit three air misses really close uh and an ejection and every time i've seen god's hands protecting my life you know i don't deserve it can't earn it but i just know because of the love of god he does he, he is enabled to take care of us in in every situation dangerous or otherwise and when you were working in Blackburn in the surgery, you must have met people who had massive problems, but they were self-inflicted. How did you cope with that? Did you, did you, I don't know, did you feel condemnatory towards them? You not, brought them not on in yourself? The slightest, like, no, not in the slightest, Roger. I, I feel um, compassion, uh, as the Lord has compassion, because there, but for the grace of God, go any one of us. Mm. And uh, I always think, you know, what my life would have been had Liz not told me about the lord jesus christ and 
the Lord has so transformed my life and now is, is doing, you know, incredible things in my life. Mm. I'm so grateful and, um, yeah, really humble, really, that the Lord would do that for me. Um, mm. So it's in that sense that I really want to share that love and to work alongside people. And I still um, do that very much today. I know you're leading a very busy uh, so my heart is yes um just a couple of final questions yeah um supposing the worst had happened and you hadn't survived that that accident yeah. would you would you be certain of heaven uh yes uh, yes I, I i was in in the ejection seat uh as the baristat time release units were ticking my thought was will i live or survive i wasn't frightened i haven't been frightened since and i'm not frightened uh i just know what the bible teaches and what i absolutely believe in the word of god that um that i will uh, you know in passing go to be absent from the bodies to be present with the lord that's what i believe wholeheartedly and and i look forward to that day and that's because of what jesus has done not because you're born in oxford and <laughs> yes. all because of christ absolutely because of the cross of christ and his blood that cleansed me from all my sin and did your father ever get to know that you were an RAF pilot, a fighter jet yes, pilot? Yes, he did. I was, did he? I, I was in, I was in training. He, he died forty six. We just married forty six years ago. He had cancer. He died within six weeks. Um, oh. And uh, yeah, Liz and I were newly married. We were just with him when he passed away. We went home, uh, but he knew that I'd got through, and uh, mm. that I'd, the one dream I had. Um, which was a milestone you say about sorties and flights it was the very first flight on that phantom oh, really? that was the biggie for me mm. i know i wasn't uh, you know it just yeah it just was the biggie so he knew that i'd done that ian it's great to chat with you i always enjoy hearing your story and i love these uh, yeah. um, the time you came and littered the Yorkshire Dales. <laughs> yeah well. but anyway <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank, thank you. Here. I hope it hasn't put people off their summer holidays when they fly. <laughs> Indeed. They'll be, they won't be windsurfing in, on Windermere, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> God bless. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, no, it was really wonderful to hear uh, Ian's story. And uh, and I really enjoyed the way that he delivered that, you know, so, with uh, such uh, straightforwardness and and very honest and uh, and not a, a, an intensely emotional um, way of speaking. Very much like you'd expect a pilot to be, um, you know, cool and calm, even in a, an obvious crisis, which we uh, we heard about. Um, there were lots of things that stood out in the story, but I think like Roger, I thought that, that, that one of the things that really impressed me was the perseverance of Ian in, uh, you know, having a dream and uh, really wanting to be a pilot and, and having lots of discouragements and obstacles to overcome. And yet, you know, he carried on and um, and he was able to uh, to get through his training and his application and then his training and to 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 get to a very long and uh, fulfilling career as well and even a near-death experience didn't put him off he, when he recovered from that then as soon as he could he seemed to have got back into the um into the cockpit and uh and on again and that's a very inspiring uplifting sort of story and i think a lot of us feel like that when we hear stories like Ian's um, about overcoming the odds and fulfilling your dreams. There are loads of books, lots of films which have the same basic structure, don't they? You know, that someone has a dream or an aspiration and it doesn't go well and they have loads of struggles and and eventually there's a happy ending that, that they get through and uh, they're, they're victorious against all the all the odds. And uh, we love stories like that, even though we know that perseverance doesn't always lead to success we love to hear stories it, it really resonates with our hearts uh, about people who've just kept going and um and had their dreams um fulfilled and it's not really surprising that that happens because um uh, the bible says that we're made in the image of god and um the god of the bible is a very uh, faithful god a god who perseveres with us he struggles with us 
uh, and um, and you know he brings us to himself. But it's not an easy process because we're so um, resistant uh, to it. Um, now the the Bible talks about God struggling to seek for us in a number of different ways, and um, in Luke uh, chapter fifteen, Jesus tells three stories. Um, about people who lost things and who had to, you know, work quite hard to get them back again. I'm going to read a short one of the, them to uh, to us now. It's from Luke chapter 15, and um, uh, uh, and it's uh, the parable of the lost coin, starting at verse eight. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully? until she finds it and when she finds it she calls her friends and neighbors together and says rejoice with me i have found my lost coin in the same way i tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of god over one sinner who repents jesus tells three stories about people losing things that, that there's the shepherd who loses that sheep or rather the sheep wanders off and the shepherd uh, goes out into the wilderness and searches diligently until he finds the sheep. And then there's the, the lost coin, the woman who has those 10 very special coins. Maybe they were financially valuable for her. Maybe they were emotionally valuable. But, but when she lost one, she was willing to search carefully until she found it. And of course, most famously of all, there's the father, um, the, uh, the prodigal son. Um, that father who searches not with his body, but with his heart. He he reaches out constantly for his two wayward sons. They're, they're both lost, aren't they, um, in their different ways. But those stories, amongst other things, teach us about the the, the perseverance of God, how he how he keeps on searching um, for his lost ones, his precious children. And later in Luke's gospel, there's a very famous verse which says that the son of man, which was Jesus' favorite name for himself, the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, I was lost once um, as a small child um, and it was on a crowded beach, uh, one sunny bank holiday, um, Barry Island. Um, and we'd gone as a family, my my mum, my dad, my baby sister and um, myself, um, along with thousands of other people, because it was one of those rare sunny bank holidays um, which we had. And, and it's a long beach, Barry Island, and it was absolutely packed. And somehow we hadn't been there very long. Um, I remember it well. Um, and my parents were distracted and um, I would caught sight of the fun fair in the distance. And I took it in my head to, to wander off. And within seconds, I disappeared into um, the crowd and, uh, you know, was completely lost amongst all the other families uh, when my parents came to their senses. Now, I didn't realise I was lost. Uh, I plodded my way along the beach quite a long way, climbed up the, the steps at the other end, got to the fair ground. And there was a Punch and Judy show um, in those days. Um, that type of violence was allowed. And we um, and we sat on a mat, about 50 or 60 of us, and we watched this Punch and uh, Judy show. And I really enjoyed it. You know, I, I, I was there with the other children shouting along and and uh, watching what was going on, completely oblivious of the mayhem that was erupting down on the beach as um, people were recruited to go and search for this four-year-old or uh, whatever who was wandering around the beach uh, on their own. And uh, I was enjoying myself. I was lost, but I had absolutely no uh, fear or worry about that um, at all. And that went on for about 20 or 30 minutes. Um, and uh, it was it was going well and the puppet show held my attention and um, I was just sitting there with everybody else. I looked like just all the other children. And then suddenly something happened which completely shook my little world. Um, and something happened that woke me up to the reality of my situation. I heard an ice cream van. It's a very ordinary thing, isn't it? 
nothing special. It was an ordinary ice cream van. But I, I still, I think I remember my sequence of thinking, which was very straightforward. An ice cream van? Oh, I quite like an ice cream. I'll ask my mum and dad if they'll buy me an ice cream. Where are my mum and dad? And um, and so at that moment, that little ice cream tune going off provoked that train of thought. And uh, I woke up to the reality of my situation. I was lost. I didn't know where my my parents were and everything um, unraveled or um, worked out very quickly after that, because, of course, I immediately burst into tears. Uh, there was a distressed child in the middle of the Punch and Judy show. Loads of adults came to help. Uh, I don't know whether that would happen these days, but in those days, you know, seeing a distressed child, people would come in. Um, I don't know where my mum and dad is. They picked me up and they carried me to the lifeguard uh, at the front of Barry Island Beach. Um, where a large party of people were hysterically searching around <laughs> for me and my parents were distraught um, and I was reunited with them. I never got an ice cream. We went straight home after that, but at least um, I was found. And I think about that situation and the lostness of it often because it was a, a, a very similar situation for me spiritually. Um. And it might be similar for, for many other people as well. And, um, and and perhaps even Ian in his story was hinting a little bit um, at this because um, like him, I was brought up to go along to church every Sunday to chapel in the Wales, not Church of England and um, and Sunday school. But like him in my early teens, I lost interest in it and um, I wandered away. Um, a lot of my peers uh, did the same. And I didn't miss God. Um, actually, he'd never been important to me. Um, he was important to my parents, but he'd never been important to me. And so when I, I left church, I never I never really missed it. I was enjoying my ordinary life without him. And uh, I was exactly the same as I was on that beach. I was lost, but I didn't really think about it. It didn't bother me at all. And then one day when I was about 17, I heard it. Um, it was the spiritual equivalent of that ice cream van. And um, and it woke me up for me. Um, and it's different things for different people. Um, Ian dis discussed the pressure that he was under at work. Well, for me, it wasn't that for me. It was meeting some friends at school who were Christians and um, they had a real relationship with God and it really made a difference uh, to um, their lives. And we'd gone to a youth club, we'd had loads of fun. We sat down afterwards and um, they had a Bible study. Don't remember anything about that. But I, I realized as they opened their Bibles, just that simple act, that actually I wasn't like them, that they were found. And I realized I was lost. I didn't know I didn't know any of the theological terms around it, but I realized that they were in and I was out. And um, it made me feel um, uh, very uneasy. And just like on the beach, as soon as I realized I was lost, everything worked out so quickly. I, I realized that actually there'd been a search party all along, that, that actually in the background, God had been really active preparing things um, to be ready for me once I realized I was lost to be quickly united with him and that unease um, uh, grew in my heart I went along to church I hadn't been to church for ages um, on Sunday but now I was going differently now I knew I was lost and I was listening and uh, I heard the same message um, that I'd heard before that um, you know that I was a that I was a sinner that I had no relationship with God and I knew it to be true now I never knew it before and I knew I couldn't save myself I knew that um, I needed to be rescued and I heard that Jesus had come to rescue me and I was interested like never before and that Sunday evening um, when they asked people to respond to that um, I, I responded. I knew I needed to be saved. I knew I needed to be forgiven. I knew that Jesus had died in my place, taken the punishment I deserved. And most of all, I knew that he would find me and um, and take me and take me home. 
just like my five-year-old self on Barry Island Beach, my 17-year-old self found rest with um, my Heavenly Father um, at that stage. We're all lost. Everybody's lost. Um, some people are lost and they don't know it. Um, some people are lost and they sort of know it, but they don't really care about it. Some people are lost and they they know it and they care about it, but they don't know what to do about it. And in a way, that's what these programs are all about. They're, they're for people who are lost. It might be that they're going to be the wake up call. It might be that they're a signpost, um, a lifeguard, someone who can bring them back together um, with their family. So I wonder, what about you? What's your spiritual situation? Um, maybe you're lost. Maybe you're thinking about how you could be found this evening. As I said, Jesus said he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And, you know, he he saves us through us coming to him through through prayer. Um, we reach out to him with our hearts on that evening when I was 17 year, years old and I heard the message. All I had to do, I didn't I didn't have to do anything. I just where I was sitting in my seat. I just needed to cry out to him. Ian, in his testament, he said he just needed to, to sit on his bed and and cry out to him. And that is, that is all you need to do in order that you can be found. Very often on these meetings, we pray a simple prayer. Um, and we say, pray it along with us. Make it your cry, your prayer to God. And just like he answered me, just like he answered Ian, God will answer you. And you too can know what it is to go from being lost to being found. So in a, I'm going to finish it and um, I'm going to say a prayer. Um, it's only a simple thing, a sorry prayer, a thank you prayer and a please prayer. Um, and if you make it your prayer and sincerely ask God to to rescue you and find you, then he definitely will. And at the end, Dave, I think we'll put up the uh, details. You can contact us. We can help you if uh, if you prayed the prayer. We can help you if you if you want to know more, if you think, well, I, I, I you know, I don't fully understand it. I need to I need to uh, to, to know some more. Contact us again. Um, but the most important thing is, you know, uh, you know, uh, do you know you're lost? Do you care? And if you do, um, this is what you can do about it. And you can do it right now. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that. You sent your son to be the saviour of the world and that you believe in rescuing people and finding people. Lord, we're sorry that um, we, leave, we leave you, we wander away. And uh, we're sorry that we do things which grieve you. Um, and Lord, we thank you that you've sent your son to rescue us and made a way back to you through his death on the cross, dying in our place, taking our sin upon himself, bearing our punishment. And we ask you, please find us, please rescue us, please save us. Draw us into your family, make us one with you. Lord, we, we desire this and we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.